everyone, what's up? Cold here, and I'm going to be going over the Big 12 game main slate we have here on uh, Friday, July 7. Back after I uh, wasn't able to get anything up for yesterday, middle of the week sometimes gets um, a little bit difficult for me, same with the weekends. In any case, here we are for a Big 12 gamer uh, on a Friday, so usual early day spiel. Uh, I've got some red numbers in standard deviation, so obviously that's suggesting um, that we've got some noise in the projections and the ownership figures here. Overall, pretty spread out for the most part here today. Uh, right up at the top, there's a lot of good arms here, but not necessarily all in the best spots. You know, we've got some very attackable spots for sure. Um, but that's why we're seeing a lot of spread out ownership so far. Pretty obvious spot down here with Aaron Savali, I think. Um, you know, decent cash play for sure. Um, if you're chasing upside, we'll probably want to get to some of the more expensive arms uh, up here, you know, in some not excellent matchups, but uh, a lot of good arms going for sure. A lot of guys with so certainly, you know, 25 and 30 point upside pretty regularly uh, whenever they take the mound. But, um, you know, some difficult spots to go after. I think some of the price tags here are accounting for that. So we can be a little bit more confident in just clicking in the names that we like. Uh, but as you can see, you know, we can get pretty spread out here. We don't have to focus all that much about trying to exploit certain ownership spots necessarily. Um, plenty of different spots we can play. And, you know, I think today that's probably going to be the best construction, best type of construction. We just pick two of these arms up here, go with it, whoever you like, and then, you know, avoid some of these guys down here in the bottom um, and play some offenses, right? So we're going to have to find some value, of course, because if we're playing cheaper uh, or rather most expen more expensive stacks um, and or more expensive pitchers, I should say, and... Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to just attack every single super cheap arm down here um, because the hitters are mostly pretty expensive in those scenarios, too. So some natural balancing we've got to go through, um, but that's really no different than any other tournament slate. So let's just get into it. Texas and Washington. This is one of the most expensive teams today, Texas. Uh, that's in a really damn good spot, right? They get Trevor Williams on the other side. Cody Bradford going for them. I think he's super attackable, too. I don't want to play him. He's 4,000, uh, but he gets the Nationals who don't strike out, and his numbers are horrific. He's got a 27% K rate, okay, uh, in his six appearances, four full starts. Um, you know, but he's given up a lot of power to the right side and a lot of hard contact here. I don't really want to deal with this. 42, 43% of hard contact. I mean, we got a short sample. Let's not get it confused, right? But 43% um, hard contact with an 033 ground ball to fly ball against right-handers, that's not good. So he's a four-seamer change guy. The cutter's not giving him any value to induce soft contact. He's just at 6.5% soft contact induced so far to the right side. He's got a 17.5% barrel rate. Yeah, we got a, a short sample, but my goodness, this is a huge, huge figure. He's given up a lot of really loud contact. So I think you can play both Texas going after Trevor Williams. He's a total non-starter, even at his cheap price tag, 5500 But you can play some Washington also as well. Um, against left-handers, pretty sneaky. Unfortunately, really their best hitter against left-handed pitching is Lane Thomas up at the top of the lineup. He's 5000 now. And he's been running pretty hot this season. He's running about four and five ticks in every major category, meaning batting average, WOBA, slugging, ISO, versus his expected metrics. So unfortunately, he's expensive now, and he's probably uh, overperforming quite significantly. So not really my favorite, un unfortunately, there, even though this is a really good fundamental spot. Um I think my favorite price adjustment would probably be like a Stone Garrett or something like that. Maybe some Jamer. He can get the ball in the air a little. Um, Stone Garrett I do like at uh, 2,500. Really like 10-ball season against lefties. Should be in there today. So you can mix in like an Alex Call if you want to come off of some of the Lane Thomas or something. Uh, I mean, if you're stacking the Nationals, you're probably just including Lane Thomas. Um, but still, you know, we know the deal with the Nationals over here. 
just not a lot of power, right? 145 aggregate ISO, just a 104 WRC plus. Not going to create a hell of a lot above average, just a 104 here. But the 18% strikeout rate, they're still going to make some contact. Um, you know, so not overly thrilling and overly impressive. But Cody Bradford here really been giving it up. He's been super efficient early in the count. 76% strike one's very good in the short sample. And so I like that. He's been able to get ahead of hitters. But for the most part, still pitching to way too much hard contact. Location of this three-pitch mix here, you know, he really needs to work on that still. So um, definitely attackable with some filler pieces of the Nationals. Hard to get there with them on a full 12-gamer, of course, in full stacks. But if you want to stack this game, the Nationals are cheap enough on this side to make some Texas pieces like a Corey Seager, right? like an Addy Garcia, Marcus Semien, the guys that you want to play for the Rangers, makes them, with some cheap Nationals pieces, a little bit more uh, attainable and easier to get to. So certainly just offense here for me in this game. Um, I want to go after Trevor Williams. Of course, he's been terrible against both sides this season. More so in the batting average against lefties, but more so in the power against righties. So he's attackable to both sides. Uh, hard contact, not as um, not as high as you'd really like to see. There's a couple of several other guys, notably like Cody Bradford on the other side of the game, that give up way more hard contact compared to Trevor Williams here. He, he does still give up balls in the air, and he's got a high barrel rate himself. Um, but a little bit harder to stack against Trevor Williams sometimes. He does sequence pretty decently, even though the arsenal is not all that impressive anymore. Changeup's really bad now. It used to be excellent earlier in his career, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, still attackable for sure, but the price tags from Texas probably going to keep you keep your exposures down a little bit. Very hard to get to 6,000 for Semyon, 62 for Seager, 57 for Addy Garcia in the outfield, 46 for Nate Lowe. It's it, Kind of elevated for him a little bit, even though he's a pretty damn good hitter. Josh Young, 5,000. Jonah Heim, 4,800. Got to play, this is similar to Atlanta, you got to play some guys down at the bottom, like Ezek Duran, Garver. Uh, Garver's a really interesting catcher piece here today if he's in, in the lineup. Really strong contact figures and a good fly ball hitter. Um, against Trevor Williams, that batted ball sort of profile, neutral, and even, you know, fly ball hitters, slight ground ball hitters. All of that is really in play here because he's not going to throw it past anybody. We'll strike out a few more right-handers, but um, you know everybody playable from Texas, if you can make the stacks happen, they're going to be popular. Um, not as popular as you know, like a Boston who we'll get to, but um, you know, one of the more popular teams of the day. It's not because the yeah, it's mostly because of a, a really good fundamental spot against Trevor Williams. But it's not because of their price tag, certainly, I guess is uh, a better way to say it. So offense only here for me, and uh, no pitching. Just going to stay off of these guys tonight. Cubs and the Yankees here. Um, we do get Carlos Rodon back tonight, finally. Um, we'll get to him in a sec. Jamison Tyon, 5,200, it's just it's still not there. Um, it's, it's him and, like, a, a cookie that are battling it out for the worst numbers of the season and to see who could turn it around the quickest. Well, Cookie seems to be winning that battle here. It's not tie-on. Um, 5200 for him. Now, the price tag's going to put him in play on a full 12-gamer. Yeah, you, I don't think we're going to need to get down here. There's actually another guy cheaper uh, or in this cheap range that I think I'd rather play um, that's not at Yankee Stadium. So I'm going to leave tie-on you know, off the board again today even though the Yankees have been you know pretty poor to say the least uh, over the last little while since Judge went down right just 93 WRC plus here not striking out a lot still making some contact and they've got some guys that will hit for a little bit of pop um, Anthony Volpe's been fantastic recently Glaber has really kept this lineup afloat for the most part um, Stanton coming into his own a little bit, warming up now that he's got more ABs. Uh, Rizzo is still hitting 270 or whatever somehow, even though he's been terrible for the last month. Um, they still got guys that have got a little bit of pop. Josh Donaldson's gotten into some balls recently, still has a very high barrel rate, making good hard contact when he makes contact also. 
So I think it's a dangerous spot for Ty on here, even though he's better against righties, right? He has the 25% K rate against the right side this year. Still gives up batting average, though. 278 XBA and a big ex-Woba, 363 in aggregates. Far, far higher to the lefties. So my preferences here would be a Rizzo. Billy McKinney's been dealing with a little bit of a, uh, maybe a shoulder, I think it was. Um he might be back in there tonight. We'll have to see. But Rizzo, certainly from the left side, is is going to have to be the favorite. Um, strikeout rate to the lefties far lower, right? Just it's 17% here, 35% hard contact. A lot of fly balls to the lefties. 060 ground ball to fly ball. Super attackable there, and he's given up a 346 ISO as tie on. So definitely the favorite there would be uh, Rizzo. But um, I like a cheap. Volpe up at the top. He's been fantastic. Multi-hit games all over the place over the last two weeks. Really heating up again after they brought him back up. Uh, or I guess I should say they shoved him down to the bottom of the lineup, kind of get him right. Um, really seeing the baseball much better now. So I think Yankee stacks are very much in play. I generally don't like going after super cheap pitchers like this. Um, but I think the fundamental spot really warrants that, and the price tags are very much playable. They're all also going to see a little bit of ownership here today, but um, probably one of the top value stacks on the board, I think, really, what, one through six, one through seven even. Uh, you could throw in either catcher Higgs or Trevino, whoever that is, and IKF, even though I hate playing him, he's got dual eligibility and he's 2,200. He can make... Yankee stacks happen for you if you need to get to like two expensive arms with a, a cheaper secondary stack or something. Um, very much in play. Carlos Rodon, he is back, like I said. Problem here is, uh, I don't have, of course, any numbers in the sheet. I've got just you, this year's numbers for everybody. Um, and he will be making his debut for the year. He hasn't seen a big league, big league lineup since spring training. And he's 9,100 here. He's made two rehab starts or a couple of rehab starts however many um in high a and the high a is not is not a big league lineup right this is the cubs even though they're not fantastic right they're just kind of a lukewarm break even offense um you know against left handers they're going to strike out a little bit right 25 percent, and that does give rodon a little bit of upside he's a very high strikeout arm Right, of course, last year he had what 30 and 32 percent strikeout rates to both sides. He was fantastic. That's what got him this Yankee contract. Um, overall attackable for sure, but he's 9100 and he's probably only going to be stretched out to about you know 60, 65, maybe 70 pitches here. And I think we need a little bit more depth out of that, considering all of the other arms that we've got on the mound today. Um. I think we're going to need a little bit more than roughly four innings. He does have strikeout stuff. He's always had a little bit of problem spraying it, too. He can get a little wild and pitch to a bit much con too much contact and, and walk some guys. So um, I want to play the wait-and-see game here with Rodone. I do like the price tag in general, but there's so many other guys that we can play here that are in – you know, similar matchups that don't have the pitch count woes hanging over their head here a little bit. So I think he's in play. If you want to play some correlated Yankees teams, he's probably going to get some run support, and he does still have really good whiff stuff. And this is still the Cubs who are going to strike out a lot, right? This is Rodon. He's a well above average arm in general. Um, so I think he's in play, but at 15% of my teams, I'm probably going to come in under that and pivot it to somebody else um, in this range, probably a bunch of guys bunch of other guys in this range a little high in the ownership for me uh, I do like the projection and the value score of course but um, I'm going to play the wait and see game with him I think you could take a couple of you know sort of leverage pieces for the Cubs on the other side say a Suzuki he's at 3,500 still very very cheap here uh, Chris Morell he's expensive nobody's going to play him he's got his dual eligibility with third base back in the outfield he's 4,900 but he's at Yankee Stadium, and he's a high-variance hitter. He's going to hit the ball over the wall, uh, or he's not going to do anything for you. So um, I think it's a really interesting tournament play, getting a little bit of coverage with the Cubs on the other side of Rodone here. Um, Patty Wisdom may be back as well. So there, there's some, some guys with a little bit of pop. If you want to go after 
a little bit of Rodone here. I think that's that's perfectly okay. Uh, Wisdom it was actually activated, what, three, four days ago, uh, and he's had some ABs here. 3,800 playable. He'll probably be down at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, down at the bottom. So it's not my favorite price-adjusted play at third base down there necessarily. <clears throat> Excuse me. But... Uh, a piece here or there from the Cubs, I think, is in play. You can always play Nico, really high contact hitter, um, and his power is going to play up a little bit here at Yankee Stadium. So I think it's fine to play a couple of the Cubs, even though Rodone would be the preference. Uh, I just have depth concerns for him. Uh, so I'm going to play the wait-and-see game with him. Um, I'm okay leaving it on the shelf with, you know, seven, eight other guys in this same range I think are, are perfectly playable as well today. Um, I think, I don't think we're really taking all that much risk, just kind of leaving him off the board. So that's how I'm going to play it. All right, let's move on um, to Oakland and Boston here. Uh, Luis Medina on the mound. I think he's a total non-starter, right? He's got a 20% K rate and a 13% walk rate, 50% strike one flat. Uh, no thanks. Got no chase in him here, just 26%. He does have an ERA of 6.5 with an XFIP of 5, so there's that. But uh, you got to be able to throw strikes early in the count, otherwise you're just going to elevate your pitch count. Um, so he's come out of the bullpen a couple of times this year. They've done the opener nonsense with him. They may do that again. Who knows? Uh, no matter at 5,800, there's even cheaper guys that ra that I'd much rather play that don't get Boston at Fenway tonight. So no thanks. Um, Boston will be the most popular team today. They're leading the way pretty substantially in, in ownership right now and in value score as well. So, um, you know, you're not going to fool anybody here with Boston. They're cheap, and they're very attainable, super easy to get to. Jaron Duran should be back. Just got a day off yesterday, I believe. 3,500 at the top. I do want to get to some righties here, though. If you want to get contrarian with some Boston stacks, include some right-handers here because Luis Medina is giving it up way more to the righties this year. 292 ISO with a 399 Woba and a 38, 39% hard contact rate. Neutral ground ball to fly ball with two and a half homers per nine. And this is pitching a lot of games in Oakland. So he's really giving it up to the right side. 285 batting average, three and a half ticks higher than to the lefties. Uh, we still have a short-ish sample on him, just 11 appearances and eight starts, but he's still seen 250 hitters, give or take. So with the 175 ISO to the left-handers, yeah, the Sure, a lower strikeout rate, but it's basically the same at 20% flat. Um, and a 292 ISO to the righties, I'd, I'd rather mix in some less popular right-handers. Uh, unfortunately, they they really don't have a lot of them. Uh, Justin Turner, you got to play him at sole first base, lost his third base eligibility again. He's 4,000. That's a fine play. I'd probably rather, you know, just in terms of positional flexibility here, play Adam Duvall, even though he is 700 more expensive in the outfield. He's just an outfield piece, and you don't have to eat up your first base spot with Justin Turner. Even though he's been very good for a 63-year-old, he's still got a north of 800 OPS, and he could very well hit 25 jacks this year and, and drive in 100. So he's been very serviceable up at the top of the lineup, and he still didn't strike out. So it's a fine play. And certainly don't leave him off if you're playing uh, Boston Stacks. Of course, you're going to play Devers. Of course, you're going to play Yoshida, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on down the list. They may very well get Yu Chang back tonight. He's very likely to be activated. He's 2,100 at shortstop. You can play Tristan Cassis as well at 2,600. A lot of ground balls here from the left side or to the left side from Medina. So that'll play a little bit into Cassis' uh, batted ball profile. Very high fly ball hitter. He's going to walk, though. Um, so that might take you off of him at sole first base. Um He's going to walk, and he's going to hit a lot of fly balls because he could very well pop some up here. doesn't necessarily just have to go over the wall. Hard contact rate is lower to lefties, and he doesn't give up as much power and or as much batting average. So um, I think even you know just price agnostic, I'd probably just prefer Justin Turner. Um, but everybody from Boston here in play, I don't want anything to do with Medina because they also still get the Oakland bullpen as well. Brenda Bernardino, as we mentioned, is probably just going to open for them. Um, and it's going to be a, uh, let's see, I, I think another left-hander coming in for them. Yeah, it'll be uh, Brandon Walter. Um, he's the probable long reliever, and, you know, he's another left-hander. So what that means, unfortunately for the A's here, uh, they might very well be missing um, Asturi Ruiz. 
up at the top of the lineup. He dove back into the bag, probably jammed a, a finger or a wrist or maybe a shoulder or something. Uh, they may give him the next couple of days off going into the All-Star break. They really want to keep him healthy. Um, he's got a chance to steal a lot of bases this year and sort of etch his name into the record books. And in one of the last seasons here, a really, really down year for Oakland, he's been a bright spot for them uh, as a young play. Um, so they may just kind of give him the next couple of days off. Can't really play him. He's been the, the best piece we've played really all season from the right side against lefties. However, they've got some cheap pieces here that you can fill in. If you want to stack this game to get to some of the more expensive guys on the other side, like Devers, Duvall, Yoshida, etc., you could play some of the righties over here from Oakland, like a Jordan Diaz at second base, 2,100, that's fine. Um, Boston doesn't have a second baseman on the other side. So, yeah, you can play Jordan Diaz. Led Miss Diaz, you can play him dual eligible at third or shortstop or whatever, 2,200. Brent Rooker, you can play, still got pop, and he might be finding it once again. Um, and this ballpark here in Fenway is going to play up his production a little bit as well. Shailing Lear's is probably going to be up at the top of the lineup because they are missing Carlos Perez, um, who is on the DL now. So uh, Shea at 2,800 also will play up pop here. Nick Allen is playable. It's Stone Min down at the bottom, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the picture. Offense really only here for me. I'm not dealing with the bullpen shenanigans, even though they're both very cheap. Uh, Bernardino, he's only going to go an inning or two. And Walter is also 4,000. Uh, no idea what kind of shenanigans they might play here uh, against Oakland. So pitching, or no pitching rather, and offense only for me and pretty much everybody if you can balance the ownership. Okay, let's move on to the Royals and the Guardians. Daniel Lynch on the mound. Intriguing price tag here for him. Um, he's not really been as bad in his full seven starts. I mean, he's still, there's a lot of variance. Let's not get carried away with the Daniel Lynch here. Um, but he's been a little bit better. In his, what, second, third year or something in the league. Um, but there's variance with him. He he just does early sort of Daniel Lynch type of the things where he pitches to all the contact in the world in the first two innings. He gives up five runs, and then he settles down and doesn't give up any production after that. Um, kind of a real fishy sort of guy to get super comfortable with. Um, and definitely not against Cleveland, right? They're not going to strike out a lot, and he's only exhibiting so far just a 16% K rate in his seven appearances this year. But he's good early in the count, right? Throwing strike one, staying off of the barrel and, and not walking people a lot here. So uh, overall pretty equitable, even though he does still have some susceptibility to the right side. 185 ISO allowed, just a 16% K rate there. 35% hard with some fly balls at 075, ground ball to fly ball. Not giving up a lot of batting average to them just yet. It's just a 213. So do we want to really go after him necessarily with some Cleveland here. I mean, they're cheap and they always pop because they're cheap. You could play in a med Rosario, but he's not really my favorite shortstop play. There's so many shortstops you could play today. Um, and he doesn't have any power. Josie Ramirez, of course, from the right side of the plate, he's 5,800 though. Not my favorite third base play. Probably rather play Rafi Devers at 4,900, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they don't really have any other right-handers. You're super comfortable. Like you're not playing a mile straw or Cam Gallagher, um, with full Cleveland stacks on a 12-game slate, right? Just super, super low probability to get there with those guys. Josh Bell, maybe, but you got to play him at sole first base, and he's 2,800, and it kind of stinks. So not overly thrilling to be playing Cleveland here tonight, even though they are cheap. Um, you know, Daniel Lynch is respectable enough. Do you need to go all the way down here? Probably not. If you do, I'd still rather play somebody else. We'll get to it in a little while. Um because Lynch isn't going to strike anybody out, and Cleveland's not going to strike out themselves. So despite the fact that they are a super bad offense, right, just a 140 ISO, 27% hard contact, 87 WRC+, plus, they're still going to make a lot of contact, uh, whether it's good or not. Um, so I'm going to probably just come off of him and stay off it, but that really kind of takes me off of a lot of the Cleveland guys. I don't want to play Ahmed Rosario, and Josie Ramirez, I think there's several other third basemen that you could get much more upside for the price uh, on today's slate. So probably just going to leave most Cleveland off today. Um, and honestly, I don't really feel all that bad about fading Cleveland on a 12-game slate. If they get there, they get there. But um, it's not all that often that I'm going to get burned by coming off of Cleveland on 12 games. Aaron Sabali on the mound, like I kind of briefly alluded to, he's a 
decent cash play here tonight. Uh, have upside concerns usually with with Savali. This is a very good matchup, of course, but he's only got the 18.5% K rate. Uh, he does sequence very well. Has six pitches that he goes to work with. It doesn't give up a lot of production. Um, you know, he's got a 3.0 ERA here, however, with a 4.75 xFIP. This could be a spot where you know, with a lot of ownership coming to him in a really good matchup. Uh, that he could get picked apart. We could see some regression in the strand rate. 81% is a bit too high, certainly for a guy that's not going to throw it past anybody. But he's got good control. He's elite early in the count with strike one, 71% here. That's fantastic. He's got a pretty damn good cutter, and he can induce a little bit of swing and miss to the left side, even though it's only an 18% aggregate strikeout rate. He does have some decent swing and miss here with the curveball. But he stays off of the barrel. Despite a lot of contact, it's probably not as high a contact rate as you would expect. 78% is not 83% like uh, Trevor Williams or something like that. A couple of these other guys that we'll get to today. Um, So he's very much in play at 7,700. This is a bad, bad offense. It's a bad team over here. Um, And he's got a good cutter that is going to help neutralize a lot of the production that the left-handers would otherwise be able to uh, achieve against him. So... I've got no problems playing Savali tonight. I usually don't like doing that on full 12 gamers. I, I And as I mentioned, I do have uh, upside concerns. So with so many other arms a little bit more expensive that have far, far more raw upside, uh, I'd probably rather get to them in tournaments. But I, I do like him. He's in play, certainly. He's got 25 in the tank, definitely. Because he can still run for seven innings and strike out six and not give up any production because his offense is terrible over here for the Royals. So I think he's fine and certainly in play. I'm mostly just going to stay off of offense because the offenses are bad. Um, and I think both pitchers are decent enough to take apart these offenses or at least keep them off the board. Uh, I have upside concerns for both of them, so that's probably why I won't play them. But uh, really kind of off of offense, so mostly just a write-off game for me for the most part. That's sort of one-offs here or there. Uh, okay, let's move on to Baltimore and Minnesota. Cole Irvin on the mound. He's another one of these guys down in this cheap range that I'm just going to leave off. Um, even though I like going after Minnesota with well, pretty much everybody, I don't respect the offense. They're all bad. They all strike out. They don't hit for any power. Um, and they don't create. They don't steal bases. They're just a bleh, offense. I don't think Cole Irvin really quite has enough upside for me to consider jumping on the the train down here at 5,000. There's there's still a lot of right-handers in this lineup, and he's given up production in spades to the righties this year. Uh, even since he came back up, what, five, six starts ago or something, he's still getting really picked apart and not able to suppress really at all. He's got a 630 ERA, but his XFIP is still north of five. So um, despite a sub 70% strand rate. Yeah, like you got to pitch to way less contact than 82% in order for me to consider some positive regression to be coming your way. So uh, five pitches is fine. Cutter is fine. Should keep the right-handers off the board a little bit, but he just doesn't induce any soft contact with it. Doesn't have any swing and miss here that you can be really comfortable, um, you know, with clicking in some Cole Irvin. So I'm I'm just going to leave it off. And unfortunately, he gives up 38% hard and a 14.5, 50% barrel rate here. Uh, so despite a, an attractive price tag, I liked playing him a little bit when he was in Oakland in a big ballpark. Um, and this offense is bad over here for the Twins. You know, against lefties, what, 26% K rate. Not going to create runs or hit for any power. Um, the price tag would have to put him in play because everybody at 5,000 is in play uh, if they're a true starter. But overall, I mean, Correa, I like at 4,600. Donnie Solano got dual eligibility at first and second base now. At 2,600, he's going to pop in value for sure. Buxton at 54, this is a fine play, even though he strikes out a crap load. Kyle Farmer, super cheap, dual eligible. Second and third base, 2,300. He'll likely be in the four hole. Uh, etc. On 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 down the list. You know they're gonna have eight righties probably in the lineup tonight. So this is a, d- a difficult spot for Irvin. I'm gonna just leave him off the board too. I think the Twins are. I mean they're certainly gonna pop in value. Um, are they a top, you know, productivity stack for us? Yeah, maybe not. You know there's certainly other teams that have higher upside, but uh, very much in play because of their their price tags here. You can get to Correa and Buxton, the guys that actually do have real 
significant upside. Um, and then mix in a cheaper guy, Donnie Solano. Probably not. But uh, not my favorite, at least. But Kyle Farmer, uh, I think, is fine. Josie Miranda, fine, too. Either catcher, you know, whatever. Uh, Michael Taylor, good pop against lefties, et cetera, et cetera. So twins certainly in play. Bailey Ober on the mound, he's also in play. This is one of the really intriguing tournament plays, I think, is on the board here tonight. Now, he's not going to wow us with strikeout stuff in this particular matchup against Baltimore because they're going to have seven lefties in the lineup uh, almost definitely. And... He's just got a 22% K rate. It's below average, but the production against left-handers is actually pretty encouraging here. Um, sub 200 batting average allowed, 250 WOBA, and a 101 ISO. These are really damn good numbers. His problem, even though he's got quite elevated strikeout stuff to the right side uh, compared to the lefties, it, it's that he gives up a lot of hard contact to the to the right-handers, and a lot of fly balls, right? 050 ground ball to fly ball with 38, 37% hard contact here. That's a, a question mark um, in general. But like I, like I mentioned, you know, Baltimore is going to go very lefty heavier tonight and lefties this year haven't hit, hit for all that much power, even though he does still give up fly balls. The hard contact number is far, far better. It's at 27, 28% here against the left side. Now he does still have a, a 270 ERA with an XFIP of four and a quarter. Some regression probably coming there, an 80% strand rate, some regression coming there, definitely. He's got an 095 whip, some regression coming there almost certainly. Has a 10% barrel rate, that's the contact to the right side and the 191 ISO that he gives up. Um, but he doesn't walk anybody, so he would be pretty hard to stack against despite the really heavy platoon split here. So I think that makes him very intriguing in tournaments at 8300 I, I think this price tag is very playable. And you can see here in the value score and the projection that, you know, pushing 28 and 30 for somebody in this range, this price range at very low ownership, I think it's a really cool tournament play here. Even though you're going after a pretty dangerous offense that doesn't strike out a lot, uh, they're going to make contact, and they've got a lot of guys that will hit for power. Uh, I think Bailey Ober could be very serviceable here tonight because he's got a very, very good changeup. And that will keep the lefties off the board. So uh, I think that puts him in play. And I think I might try and get a little bit here. It, you, you don't really have to get all that much exposure. You can swap out some of the Rodone ownership, for example, uh, and pivot it to Bailey Ober. He's cheaper, and he's, ha what, half as popular? Um, so I think that's a, a pretty intriguing play. Bailey Ober definitely doesn't have depth concerns uh, or anything like that. He might in this matchup, but uh, he's got really good chase, and I think he could run pretty deep into a game here, run seven innings, and strike out a K an inning or so. Um, so really intriguing builds that you could make here with the Twins. Um, the Twins are going to be popular, but you could play some correlated stacks with Baby, Bailey over because they're likely to give him some run support, and I think it's a pretty okay spot for him. Okay, let's move on to Seattle and Houston. Um, Luis Castillo, two really good arms on the mound here. Luis Castillo and Hunter Brown. Going for the Strohs. Uh, Castillo at 9400 kind of a fishy price tag for him and kind of a fishy matchup. Now, he's certainly in play, um, but as you can see, like pretty much everybody at in the 9K range here, they're going to be in play at, at about 10 to 15% ownership with really all of them. Value score on the projection here, it's fine. It's always usually pretty high for um, Luis Castillo anyway against pretty much everybody. This is a tough matchup for him, even though he's got good strikeout stuff to the right side and to the left side, for that matter. For that matter, um, tough strikeout matchup, of course, right? Just 21 and a half percent now. This is ticking down ever since Altuve came back. He's out again, but they've got Mo Dubon who doesn't strike out at all at the top of the lineup. Same with Alex Bregman, Kyle Tucker, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like these guys are are pretty difficult to get through, even though they don't hit for a lot of power necessarily. Neutral. Creation at 101 WRC plus below average hard contact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They'll still make some contact and hit for a little bit of batting average at a 247 clip against righties. This is a pretty respectable number. And where I think Castillo could be a little bit attackable, it's not necessarily in that batting average. He does give up some power, 171 ISO to the right-handers, despite the 30 and a half percent K rate. He's not going to walk anybody, so he's going to pitch to contact there. And what contact he does give up is 
pretty hard. It's pretty loud. 37% to the right-handers with a neutral, roughly, ground ball to fly ball at a buck 10. Now, he doesn't pitch to, in aggregate, really hardly any contact. It's it's 70% in aggregate to both sides here. So that certainly will put him in play in a down matchup. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine. His big problem is usually to the left-handers, where his strikeout rate is lower, his power allowed is higher, his batting average allowed is higher, etc., etc. Doesn't give up as much hard contact, but he gives up more fly balls. So he's more attackable usually with left-handers. Um, but this hard contact number and, and neutral ground ball to fly ball number with the power makes in Houston in particular makes it a little bit playable. Um, some of these Astros pieces a little bit playable, that is. From the other side, but not overly, you know, not super thrilling, to be quite honest. Mo Bone doesn't have a hell of a lot of upside, nor does Alex Bregman, even though he's got some pop. Um, Yiner Diaz got a lot of pop. Jeremy Pena looks a little bit better now. He's only 4,000 now in the middle of the lineup. I think that's a fine shortstop play there. Uh, so if you want to take some leverage pieces, maybe some short three-mans against Luis Castillo, homer hunting a little bit uh, down here in the Crawford boxes, I think this is okay. Um, but I also do think he is in play. I'd probably rather just pivot it to Hunter Brown on the other side. He's 9,200. He's got a far, far better matchup. Um, I think Luis Castillo is a, a little bit better arm, of course. Hunter Brown's still young, and he's got some variance in him, right? Sub-60% strike one for him. And he'll spray it a little bit, and we've got some depth concerns because he pitches to a good bit more contact, at least in terms... Uh, or comparison terms, to Luis Castillo, right? 77% versus 70% for Castillo. So it's not like 77 is a bad figure or anything, and he's not super attackable with either side. I would like to play him as opposed to Castillo, and I think, you know, the market is kind of agreeing here um, in the ownership difference so far. But mostly it's because of the hard contact issues that Castillo has against right-handers, and they're going to be super right-handed heavy, um, Hunter Brown is very balanced here, and he gets a hell of a lot of ground balls. He doesn't have the fly ball problem. So many ground balls here, 2.7 ground balls per fly ball in aggregate. They're going to be pretty right-handed heavy themselves, Seattle, and he's got three and a, three and a half ground balls per fly ball there. Does give up some line drives, but like whatever, um, when the line drive rate is this high. So I'd like to go after him. He's got whiffs too, right? 27.5% in aggregate, and Seattle's going to strike out at a 25% Clip against right-handers. Just an average creation offense, No power, not a lot of power, it's just average power. Same thing with the hard contact and a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So um, I'd rather play Hunter Brown if I had to choose between the two, but I think both are in play. I'm more comfortable playing Hunter Brown, higher projection, higher value, and he's cheaper, and I think the matchup's far better. So sign me up for that and maybe a couple of short Houston stacks getting some leverage off of what is likely to be some Luis Castillo ownership. Okay, let's move on. Um, Reds and the Brewers here. Andrew Abbott on the mound for the Reds. Um, you know, like, he's been fantastic. Like I've I've tried to take some shots against this guy. Really not worked out very well. Um, yeah, you, know, you still got a hundred percent strain rate. This is going to come down. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It unfortunately it might come in the second time that he's seen Milwaukee against probably the, the worst team in baseball against left-handed pitching. Um, who knows, but it is the second time he's seeing them. His first start came against Milwaukee. He went six innings, struck out six, didn't give up any production, uh, but he's been great. He did give up three runs against Colorado in that home game three starts ago, but he still struck out 10, and then he followed that up with an eight strikeout, six inning appearance uh, again in Baltimore, gave up just one run, then he struck out 12 Padres in his last outing in seven and two-thirds, again just gave up one run. He's been fantastic. Um, really hard to ignore. I think he's got to be in play simply due to the matchup. Now, we do have to keep in mind that he's 9,900 now. He was 4,000 a month ago. We talked about this with a guy like Bryce Miller, for example. Eventually, you're going to see the the upside for these guys just totally exhaust itself as the league gets a little bit more of a book on them. And you're going to see the regression really start to set in. He's got a four and a quarter XFIP here with a buck 25 ERA, right? That's a three run delta. That is huge. He's got an 088 whip. That's that's going to come up also. But the 100% strain rate, it's just, I mean, of course, you guys know that this is not sustainable. So um, 
it's going to happen eventually. It could very well happen even against a really poor team against left-handed pitching, 27 and a half. These guys are just as bad as the Twins and the Rockies against lefties. 82 WRC plus, 135 ISO, 33%. Everything is average, but they hit a lot of ground balls and they strike out a crap load. Um, a lot of ground balls, though, however, could play into the Brewers' batted ball profile and their strength here against Abbott. He's got a lot of fly balls in the tank so far here at 035 ground ball to fly ball. That is insane. So they could get the baseball on the line here. And as I mentioned, again, it is the second time they're seeing him. So if we're looking for regression, I'm going to have to side with the offense, even though I do think he's got, he's got to be in play. Um, I do like the arm. I really like the four-pitch mix in the distribution here. Getting a lot of good value so far, even though we've still got just six starts on him. Efficient early in the count. I'd like to see some more chase out of him. Um, but everything is mostly pretty okay. He's got a 9% walk rate. It's not horrible. 8% barrel rate. It's fine. But he will eventually give up some production. And uh, you're just going to have to start taking shots on him. Nobody's going to be playing Milwaukee here, and they probably shouldn't for the most part. But I'm going to play some some counter-trend sort of anti-momentum plays here um, that I've talked about like I'd like to you know, employ every now and again. And you get some leverage on him here. He's been fantastic, and he'll probably still tear him apart. But I think getting to a couple of, um, a couple of right-handed pieces from Milwaukee is pretty warranted here. I don't want any of the lefties. Still don't want to deal with that. But Willie Contreras at 44, I think it's just fine. Willie Adamas, sure, at 42, another good shortstop play. Owen Miller's been fantastic over the last... He's cooled off a little bit, but had a really good first half. Uh, Dual eligible, 3,700. Jemai Jones just opted out of his contract with the Dodgers. He was in AAA Oklahoma City. Really good numbers down there, hitting nearly 300. Um, He'll probably be up. He's 2,400. Dual second base and outfield eligibility. So very flexible here are the Brewers... Um, and this is still a hitter's ballpark. They're a bad team. Let's not get it confused. This is a good arm so far, but I want to play some regression and it, for both the Brewers and Andrew Abbott. So I want to kind of go after him a little bit here. Um, I think there's some playable pieces, including the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, Joey Weimer, Andrew Monasterio, Brian Anderson, Blake Perkins. Literally everybody in the lineup, including Yelich, if you get to stacks, is playable here. Corbin Burns, you can play some correlated stacks because he's going to see some ownership. I think he probably should. Um, this makes sense to me because he's got an F, just an elite cutter, man, against the left side of the plate. His problem is a reverse split against right-handers. It's because he only throws this cutter here. He throws the two-seamer a little bit, right? He's trying to mix this in, but it's not a good pitch. He's always focused on just the cutter, and the cutter is not a same-handed pitch. Um you know, for swing and miss or for avoiding hard contact. And as we can see, 99, I don't know where that came from, uh, 39% hard contact to the right-handers with a 21% K rate, 175 ISO, 307 Wobo is fine, 234 average is fine, but he gives up pop and fly balls to the right-handers. Compare those numbers to the lefties, where he's got a sub-200 batting average allowed, 250 Woba, five ticks better, 095 ISO. Right, that's half as much as the production that he's giving up in terms of power to the right side. 25% K rate, four ticks higher, and he's got a buck 90 ground ball per ground balls per fly ball to the lefties. Induces 22.5% soft contact, and he only gives up 21% hard contact to the lefties. Like the cutter is just an elite pitch with the cutter change combination. Induces a lot of swing and miss there against lefties. So. That said, this makes sense to me at this particular price tag, why he's seeing ownership and why he's popping the hardest at for the starting pitchers in value score so far. I don't want to play any of the Reds over here, man. They've got a lot of lefties, but this is a bad spot for the lefties. Um, and I really don't want to play the righties because they're super expensive. Matt McClain's 5,500, Johnny India's 48, and Spencer Steer's 5,200 down in the seven hole. You want to play that? I mean, I certainly don't. So... I think Corbin Burns is very much in play here. I think he's got a good bit of upside in this particular matchup because the middle of the lineup there with Ellie, Fraley, and Votto, I mean, they're not going to make all that great a contact here necessarily, even though Ellie is super dangerous. He's 5,800. Fraley's 51, and Votto's 5,000. I don't want to pay those prices in the down matchup for them. So uh, I'm going to stay off of the Reds here, and I'm going to get some Corbin Burns. I think 
All of these numbers really make sense to me so far, so I've got no problem clicking on him tonight. But I'm going to play some Brewers tour against Andrew Abbott. Even though I might have a little bit of coverage with him because Milwaukee is horrible against lefties, uh, I think playing some Milwaukee is pretty warranted, and pretty much everybody against Abbott going forward until he, he, those numbers start to regress. Uh, okay, let's move on to St. Louis and the White Sox. Uh, Jordan Montgomery on the mound here, 8100 is kind of a yeah, price tag. Like, there's some upside for him in general at this price, right? He's got 25 in the tank, but overall he's he's a pretty good arm, and we kind of have an upside concerns with him generally. I mean, in good matchups, he'll tear apart a bad lineup, no problem. He's a pretty good arm because he sequences well. His control is great. He doesn't walk anybody. He stays off the barrel, um, and he's very efficient early in the count. However, the White Sox, and, you know, let's not get it confused. The the White Sox are a bad offense over here. They're bad against left-handed pitching. They strike out a little bit more. They don't walk. They don't hit for a lot of power or hard contact, and they hit a lot of ground balls. So this is a fine spot for him at low ownership. I think that has to put him in play. Uh, in this range, probably not my favorite. Um, I'm not sure who who else I'd rather play. Probably, you know, Darvish or something like that. Um, so at this price tag, yeah, he's got to be in play. I'd probably rather play Bla- Bailey Ober, though, uh, I think, because I think the upside for Montgomery in this particular matchup, they're going to have eight righties in the lineup at least tonight, uh, the White Sox. And that's definitely the downside of the platoon for Jordan Montgomery here. 177 ISO allowed. It gives up a 250 batting average. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not nothing. 318 Woba, also not bad, but also not nothing. The 175 ISO is, you know, a notable figure here. Just a 22% K rate and a 35% hard contact rate. He's got a little bit of line drive in him against the right side of the plate. So I think that could play into some of the White Sox ground ball leaning hitters here, like a Tim Anderson in particular. Luis Robert hits the ball in the air. Uh, this is a pretty good spot for him, as a matter of fact. 5600 expensive, but he's been great. Uh, Eloy at 44 not my favorite, but, um, you know, some of these right-handers here, Jake Berger, he's probably going to strike out still somehow, uh, but he's 4300 and very playable. Andrew Vaughn, 3800 in probably what's the five-hole, very playable as well. So um, I think you get to some really off-the-board White Sox stacks, not super thrilling because they're a bad offense. And Jordan Montgomery's a good arm. Um, but I'm probably just going to leave him on the shelf. I've got upside concerns for him in this particular matchup in terms of raw strikeouts. I think he's likely to give up a couple of runs here. And I think he might have a little bit of difficulty earning those points back with whiffs and with strikeouts. So uh, that's kind of how I'd like to approach it. Not super thrilled to, to play a lot of the White Sox. Definitely some pieces here or there, but not super thrilled to play Montgomery either. Dylan Cease on the other side, he's got to be in play too, right? 8,500, he's not my favorite. I'd rather play Bailey Ober, I think. Um, But you can go after the Cardinals here a little bit. Uh, It's not my favorite, and certainly not with Dylan Cease. I hate playing this guy because he walks so many damn people. He just, his mechanics are off to the right side of the plate. He's walking 13% of righties here, and he gives up 43% hard contact to right-handers. It's just atrocious. You cannot do this. I don't care what the strikeout rate is. Uh, You cannot put people on base for free and give up this kind of hard contact against good offenses, right? Still 109 WRC plus for the Cardinals over here. 21% K rate. They'll walk a little bit, and they make some hard contact, 36%. They still got some really damn good hitters over here from the right side in particular, of course, Goldschmidt, Arenado, really Contreras has been, or Wilson Contreras, I should say, um, has been pretty okay recently. Jordan Walker, of course. And then from the left side, there's really no bargain to get through either. Brendan Donovan, um, not a super high upside bat, but they've got him leading off. Um, Lars is back and, and healthy. He's a very capable left-handed bat in the middle of the lineup, as is Nolan Gorman. Who knows what they're going to do down at the bottom, whether it's Dylan Carlson or a Tommy Edmond. Um, Edmond may be hurt. Uh, let me check here really quick. Yeah, he is. Um, so it, it'll probably be uh, a Dylan Carlson down at the bottom of the lineup, but that means they're very, very balanced. Um so it's not my favorite going after the Cardinals here. He's got to be in play because he does still have a 27.5% K rate. And he's got you know, really, really strong sti- strikeout stuff to the right side of the plate, which is what you need when you go after Goldschmidt and you go after Arenado. Um, 
So that's okay, but I am probably just going to leave him off a little bit. I don't like elevated ownership on a guy that walks too many people and elevates his own pitch count. This is still a very hard offense to get through. And when you elevate your pitch count, I've got depth concerns. He's been a little bit better recently, but he still has susceptibility in throwing too many pitches and walking people. I still don't like the mechanics, and I think he's got um, uh, some batting average negative regression coming to him here in the future and some strand rate negative regression. Um, I, I don't like that. He's really basically just a, a two-and-a-half pitch guy. He's got the curveball, yeah, but they're – his arsenal is break even. Um, so when you've got a break even arsenal and walks, I'm not super thrilled about going after pretty capable offenses here. Um, but that's kind of priced in a little bit, you know, admittedly at here, what, an 8,500 price tag. So he's in play, not my favorite personally. I'll probably just go elsewhere. Um, since there's so many other guys, but that's kind of how I'd like to approach this game. Um, you know, maybe some White Sox, probably just going to stay off of pitching. Do I want to go after Cease with some of these hitters over here? Not particularly, but I think they're definitely in play, uh, especially if Cease's ownership steams a little bit. Okay, let's move on. Mets and the Padres here. Uh, Justin Verlander on the mound, 8,600. I'm probably going to leave him on the shelf, too. I don't really like this matchup for him. Like, where's the strikeout stuff, man? Like, he used to be 27, 28%. He's at 21%. It is totally gone. 54% strike one here for Verlander. Um, this is a big, big issue for him. And at I know he's been you know, stabilizing a little compared to his early season outings, uh, but I got to see more strike one out of him. And at 8,600, there's plenty of other guys I think I'd rather play uh, in this range today, Darvish probably being one of them. Um, you, you are seeing the ownership on Verlander you know, tick down a little bit, uh, which is attractive. And if you get him at like six, eight percent. I think that puts him squarely in play, right? But um, you know, for the most part, I think there's just other guys with some more strikeout upside. He may very well pitch like he's pitching to eighty to eighty percent contact this season. He's not walking guys and it's not barrel contact necessarily, but he's still giving up fly balls as he has his entire career, and he's still giving up hard contact to right handers as he has his entire career. Now with far more contact, far fewer um, or far less strike one, I should say, and far fewer strikeouts, that makes it really dangerous to go after the Padres here, and I'd probably like to get some short stacks of them if I could make it happen. Um, I don't want to deal with this really suspicious strike one rate, and it's really not getting all that much better. It was better in his last outing at 61% uh, against the Mets, or excuse me, against um, the Giants, that was a really good outing for him. But his two starts prior to that against Milwaukee and Houston, he had a 43.5% strike one rate and a 41.5% strike one rate. So I, I don't think he's totally figured it out just yet, and I think the price tag is a little fishy here. I'd like to play some Padres, even though they're very expensive. They're they're way off the board in ownership so far. Um, so I think playing some of these guys, Manny Machado, Juan Soto, Tatis, of course, Sure, let's do it. Play some Bogarts, too. Good right-handed hitters with good power against right-handers, um, and, and including Soto, of course. Like I think that's a, a very viable little short stack, or even a full stack if you want to go after Verlander. I think it's very much in play. Um, 8,800 on the mound for Darvish. Yeah, he throws 46 pitches, and all of them are pretty okay for the most part. Um, you know, bad changeup or whatever. Bad four-seamer, that's not good. He does still give up some pop to right-handers, 21.5% K rate, 35% hard with neutral ground ball to fly ball, and a 215 ISO. Attackable there a little bit with some righties. So if you want to get off of some of the Darvish ownership, it's not all that high um, because there's other cheaper guys in the same range, of course, just at 10%. I'd rather just play Darvish, but if you want to get off, then, yeah, play some Pete Alonso. That's perfectly fine. Um you want to play a cheap Tommy Pham? Probably not in this matchup necessarily, but he's against Padres. You want to play the revenge narrative? He's kind of one of these guys that you might see uh, pop a little bit against one of his old teams. Um, you want to play Starling Marte? Probably not in this matchup. You know, my favorite would, is definitely just going to be Pete Alonso, but Frankie Alvarez starting to heat up a little bit, starting to hit the baseball over the wall and make much better contact. He's playable also. So maybe a little short. Pete Alonzo, Frankie Alvarez, and one of the lefties. You want to play Lindor? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Or Brandon Nimmo? That's fine. Uh, 
getting off a little bit of this Darvish here. But I'd much rather just play him because the ownership is low and at the price tag relative to all the other guys, uh, I think that's going to keep his ownership low. And I think that makes him a good tournament play because he still has 25 and 30 in the tank, even in a down strikeout matchup. Um, I think this is okay to play Darvish. I'm probably not going to get a hell of a lot of leverage on the field necessarily. Probably come in right around this figure if I had to guess at the moment. So Padres mostly here for me. I'm going to stay off of Verlander and mostly stay off of the Mets. But um, I think there's some playable one-off pieces here or there. I'm, I just don't want any of Verlander. Uh, okay, Pirates and the D-backs here. Rich Hill on the mound. Uh, I think he's too expensive for this matchup. Uh, even though the D-backs once again just lost Corbin Carroll, it looked a bit more ominous yesterday um, when you hurt your shoulder on a swing instead of like running into the wall like you did previously. Uh, so we got to keep an eye on that. He, he's definitely going to be out of the lineup today. Um, but what that does give us the opportunity to, to do is squeak in some... They're squeezing some Kyle Lewis, I should say. Uh, he's 2,300. They'll likely have him at the top of the lineup, and I love him against left-handed pitching and certainly against left-handers that give up power to right-handers, and Rich Hill qualifies in that respect. So 211 ISO, 34% hard contact with some fly balls down here in Arizona. Yeah, sign me up. Um, I don't want anything to do with Rich Hill here tonight in this particular matchup. Some like We played Rich Hill sometimes this season, yeah, but this is not the spot even when they're missing, you know, one of their better hitters. Now, Cattell Marte is 5,900. That's hard to get to. But the 23 for Kyle Lewis makes that pretty easy. Um, you know, that averages those two guys to, what, uh, 4,200 a pop? It's not bad. Uh, Lourdes Gurriel, he's still expensive at 4,800. He's cooled off quite a bit. Christian Walker, though, at 54, also still expensive. Very much playable and a lot of pop against left-handers. Evan Longoria at 3,400. I really like this. Carson Kelly, I like this as well at 3,000. Um, if you want to squeeze in a, another righty down at the bottom, shortstop play. We mentioned a lot of shortstop here. You could play Nick Med or something like that. Um, probably just short stacks here because I like the batted ball profile for some of these cheaper righties like a Longoria, uh, Kyle Lewis types. And it's hard to stomach Christian Walker in a 12-game slate a lot of the time. But uh, very playable for sure, and their ownership is, is not going to be all that high necessarily when you typically see a lot of ownership for right-handed teams or right-handed power hitters against Rich Hill. So uh, I think they're very much in play, and I want to try and get to some of them um, you know, really wherever I can. Play some correlated stacks with Zach Gallen. I do like Zach Gallen here tonight at 9,600. Uh, I think it's a, an okay spot for him to really get off the schneid. This is the second time he's seeing them. This season, it's been about, what, six, eight starts for him, where he's kind of struggled, admittedly, but um, they picked him apart in his last start. He went just three and two-thirds. It was a day game, I believe, in Pittsburgh. Uh, struck out just two and gave up five runs. Just didn't have any of it, and that really kind of started the cascade downward for him. And he's ridden really up and down over the last, uh, you know, 10, 12 starts or so. Um you know, in his last start, he was very, very strong. Struck out 12 Angels in seven innings. Gave up four runs, but, you know, still struck out 12. So the strikeout stuff is still there, right? Good, good whiff stuff. 27% in aggregate this season. Still not walking people. He will get onto the barrel, though, and give up a little bit of hard contact. So that's how he is attackable. 34% to the lefties, 38% to the right-handers with some fly balls. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. He'll give up a little bit of pop, only about a half a homer per nine, so not so much there, but he will give up a little bit of hard contact with some fly balls. Um, so I'd have to side with him in a generally pitcher-friendly ballpark down here and a you know, average to below average offense in general. They're not going to strike out a hell of a lot, right? Just an average strikeout here, but they're not going to create so much either, right? With just a 90 WRC+, plus. not a lot of hard average power, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that has to put Gallon in play. Uh, he's going to make some adjustments. You you can be sure that, um, you know, he was not happy about getting picked apart by the Pirates uh, in his last outing. I remember watching the game, as a matter of fact, and he was just constantly shaking his head on the mound um, every time he gave, us, gave up something. So he was not happy about that outing. In any case, that's sort of narrative. Uh, all of the numbers are going to suggest that he's very much in play still. Uh, and I don't really disagree with that necessarily. 9,600, he's probably my favorite up here. Um, 
Yeah, but once again, you could play a ton of guys in this range. You don't have to eat 20% on one of the more expensive arms. Um, but it, it's perfectly within range, and I'm going to try and get some uh, where I can. So I like some D-backs here against Rich Hill. I don't really like any of the Pirates. If you want to play some of these lefties or even a righty, like a McCutcheon uh, or a Henry Davis or something like that, play a five-man sort of leverage stack. More of a late slate play, I think, than a main slate play. But, you know, any of the top five should probably be in play. Uh, if you want to come off of Carlos Santana, mix in a Cabrian Hayes or something, I think that's probably okay. He's a high ground ball hitter, and he'll make some hard contact here uh, and be able to get the ball on the line and in, in the air. There's a 24% aggregate line drive rate for Gallon against uh, both sides. So that's how the Pirates could get there, but I think I'm going to have to side with him in most scenarios. Okay, Angels, Dodgers, Griffin Canning on the mound. I'm not going near him tonight. Um, I think this is super fishy, and... I, I like look at this hard contact number against the right side. Forty percent. He does have a 120 ground ball to fly ball, but I don't really care about that. The hard contact number is a bit outsized the range that I'm okay eating some hard contact with. Uh, when your um your ground ball to fly ball, it, I, I guess I should say the ground ball to fly ball is a bit outside of the range that I'm okay eating higher hard contact numbers. If that makes sense. Um. I would want this ground ball number, this ground ball to fly ball number to be north of 150 if I'm eating 40% hard contact on a guy. And when you're far closer to a neutral ground ball to fly ball, um, you know, you, you've got to be much better in suppressing hard contact. Otherwise, you give up, you know, gappers and balls down the line and balls over the wall. So as you can see, that translates to a 210 ISO here uh, for Griffin Canning. He's getting more ground balls there this year than he has in the past. That's the introduction or the, you know, increase in usage in the change and the curveball a little bit. Um, so he's not so heavy on the four seamer slider lean that he used to be in the past, but, uh, I think it's a super dangerous spot for him, uh, against the Dodgers. Even if this weren't the Dodgers, I'd probably want to start attacking him a little bit. He's got some whiffs, right? But I think he requires some pretty good matchups. The whiffs against the left side, of the plate this season are down to 21 and a half percent. I'd need more because they're going to still platoon a pretty good bit. Max Muncy may be starting to see the baseball a little bit better. Got into a ball again last night. Um, David Peralta, Jason Hayward, they've been really damn good. As a matter of fact, in the outfield all season, James Outman may be starting to heat up as well. And Freddie Freeman, of course, you still got to get through him. Not to mention the guys from the right side that don't strike out, Mookie and Will Smith. J.D. will strike out a little bit, but he's J.D., and he's got elite figures this year against righties and lefties. So it is a super, super dangerous matchup. I want to get to some Dodgers. They're going to be well off the board in ownership today, and I think that makes him a very intriguing stack. We've talked about it. it they haven't quite exploded just yet with one of these nights where they hit you know, five and six bombs, and you just got to have them. Um, they've only done it here or there, you know, with one guy kind of going off. But uh, I think that that time is coming here for the Dodgers, whether it's before the break or slightly after. Um, I think the Dodgers' offense is, is really kind of about to boil over here. So I want to play as much of, of them as I can. Um, 66 for Mookie's not easy. 63 for Freddie's not easy. 57 for Will Smith, not easy. Same with J.D. and Max Muncy at 55 and 51. So it's hard, uh, of course. But there's a couple of playable arms down in the cheaper range that could help you get there. Uh, Tony Gonsolin, not going to be one of them. I'm just, I'm leaving him totally off. He's got 90% Ks this year. This is down five ticks to where it was last year. Now, he's still efficient early in the count. He's still got a little bit of swing and miss to the lefties. And that's because of the split. But he's got no strikeout stuff to the same-handed hitters this year at 16%. Just no thank you. Not giving up a lot of hard contact necessarily. A little bit more to the right, or excuse me, the lefties at 35% versus 28% to the right-handers. Um, so I think some angels are are in play here. He's got a 370 ERA, but he's got an XFIP of 5, right? A low strand rate, yeah, but in the batting average, he's running about 5% hot. In the in the WOBA versus the ex-WOBA, he's running about 5 6% hot. In the ISO to the X ISO, he's running about 4 5% hot. So I, I think Tony Gonsolin's suppression metrics here are actually quite noisy, and we should see some regression. Based on the batter ball metrics here, 
you know, to the downside for him, uh, I don't like the price tag here. I don't like the matchup, even though they're missing Trout and Rendon and Drury and everybody else. Um, you know, Otani it seems like he's going to be okay. And you're now going to be able to play both Mickey Moniak and Taylor Ward in the outfield because they're probably both going to start with Trout gone. Then you can play Otani. Can't play Moose um, if you play the top three guys, right? And then you'd have to play... Hunter Renfro in the outfield, who you'd probably want to play. He's got low strikeout figures against right-handers and decent pop figures as well. So I think very much in play are, are all of the Angels here. Not super jacked about the, the bottom half of the lineup here necessarily, but Thais, Renjifo, and Eddie Escobar are not total zeros in the batter's box. And they're cheap, and they can make the more expensive guys like, uh, well, just Shohei Otani, I guess. Um but a 4,400 Renfro is not super cheap. You know, it, those cheaper guys do make that a little bit more attainable. So I like offense mostly here. I don't want to do deal with any of the pitching. I think it's a sneaky tournament game. You could see like 3-2 or whatever. Uh, but you could also see like uh, a 9-5 or something like that. Gonsolin has not been good. So I think that very squarely puts the Angels in play. Okay, let's move on to the last game of the night here. Colorado and San Francisco. And here's the uh, purple and black elephant in the room. At 5,400, I think Austin Gomber's got to be in play. Um, he's the guy down here that if I get this low, I'm I'm going to be landing on. He's been better recently. I think form is starting to uh, round into form, so to speak, uh, for him. This is a good matchup for him to suppress some contact. It's in San Francisco. It's 60 degrees. He does give up power. He does give up pop. Let's not you know, get carried away here. We don't want to get... 30% of Austin Gomber or anything, uh, but he's 2% owned, and this is a very high value score for somebody down in the 5K range. Very high projection, too. As you can see on the other side, Ross Stripling is also 5,300. He's got a projection of 9.8, and a 2.5 point projection delta for guys at the exact same price tag is a monster, monster figure. You can see how that translates in the value score here. 20 in the value score for Stripling versus 26 for Austin Gomber, and 25 to 30 is really kind of the sweet spot. Anything north of those numbers relative to their price tags is really kind of the, the target range for us. So this puts him in play. He's got high barrels, of course, but he's been more efficient early in the count recently, and he's running deeper into games and suppressing production. He's still going to give up some, some runs here or there, but this is an attackable offense, and I think he's got to be in play at 5,400. Not going to get a, a boatload of him necessarily, um, and he's still going to give up some contact, right? This team could still, they don't have to hit it over the wall necessarily, but, you know, against left-handed pitching, look at this ISO number, 130 ISO allowed, or ISO in favor for the Giants this year, and 900 PAs, 93 WRC plus, 27% hard contact with a buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. Now, Gomber's going to give up some hard contact, right? 40% to both sides of the plate. That's egregious. Right, this is way, way, way too high. There's a lot of barrels. So San Francisco, it's an upside spot for them. More of a late slate play offensively for me. But on the main slate, I do think Gomber has to be at play here. If you want to play, you know, an Austin Slater or Wilmer Flores, J.D. Davis type as a one-off or something, I don't think that's horrific. Um, you know, going after some Gomber, but. I think he's got to be in play down here at a super cheap price tag in a really good ballpark in a good weather spot against a team that swings and misses a crap load. Um, so give me a little bit of that. Do I want to play some Rockies on the other side? Yeah, maybe. CJ Crone at 3,900 is a very good price for him. Ryan McMahon, 4,200, another th nice third base play you could consider. Again, probably not super thrilling to be getting after these guys in the main slate. Mostly late slate plays here, but I think they're very much in play. 4,400 for Chris Bryant is okay as well. And pretty much all of the other guys outside of Harold Castro have to be in play to a certain degree, um, including Zeke Tovar, Randall Grichik, Nolan Jones, even a Jerry Profar, he's 3,300. The ballpark's going to play up similar to Coors Field. It should play up their, their upside a little bit more. Um, and Ross Rippling's not going to throw it past anybody, right? He, he does have a, some whiff stuff against the lefties, but we got a tiny sample here. In aggregate, right, just a 19% K rate, 15% to the right-hander. So that's what attra attracts me mostly is right-handed power here, 38% hard, and buck seventy-five ground ball to fly ball. So I want fly ball hitters, 
mostly C.J. Crone from the right side, but you can play some of these other line drive guys as well, like a Chris Bryant, Elias Diaz, um, Randall Gritchick, Zeke Tovar types as well. So I think these guys are in play on the late slate mostly, but uh, no pitching here for me outside of Austin Gomber. I think he's got to be in play. Uh, okay, we went pretty long here, but uh, we are done. Let's review quickly. Texas, Washington, offense only. No Cody Bradford, no Trevor Williams for me. I think these guys are mega attackable. I do like a little bit of Washington here where they're well-priced. Um, in particular, Stone Garrett. I think that's a very intriguing play against Bradford. Everybody from Texas, if you can make the price tags happen, go ahead. But they're in Atlanta territory now. Uh, Cubs and the Yankees, no tie-on for me here. The price tag's got to put them in play, but I, I just can't do it. Uh, I think the Yankees are very much playable. Really intriguing stack here because they're priced very well. Carlos Rodon, I'm going to leave him off the off the board today. Maybe a little bit just in correlated teams, but um, I'm worried about depth because I'm mostly worried about pitch count here. So if you want to play some Cubs on the other side and go after a guy that hasn't made a start in the bigs in quite a while, um, yeah, sure, they're okay. A couple of these guys are well-priced. Morell not so well priced, but uh, he's got a lot of pop here, and this is Yankee Stadium with a kind of variant arm, um, despite good strikeout stuff for Rodon. Oakland and Boston, um, Boston the the most popular team today for sure, because they're very well priced. You can play everybody, um, and Luis Medina on the other side. I mean, he's probably going to get beat up pretty good here tonight against against the Red Sox and Fenway. Oakland, you could play a little bit in the left-handed bullpen game that the Sox are going to roll out, uh, but they're probably going to be mi missing Asturio Ruiz, which kind of takes me off, but I do like Brent Rooker and maybe a little Jordan Diaz, Shailene Galeers type, uh, something like that. I think that's playable. Casey and Cleveland, um, probably very little pitching for me. I'll have some Savali. I think he's in play more so in cash than in tournaments, but because uh, I'm worried about upside compared to all of the other guys, but I think he's very much in play. No offense really for me. I don't think I don't like the offense because they're bad. Um, and really not a lot of upside necessarily going after two respectable arms. Uh, I, I don't think Daniel Lynch is necessarily in play for me because Cleveland is a still a super hard team to go after with a low upside arm. Um, Baltimore and Minnesota. I'm off of Baltimore here. I kind of like Bailey over in the mid range is a super off the board tournament play. If you're playing a very chalky stack like a Boston or something, Bailey over can make that happen for you. You can play him with the chalky twins as well. I think that's uh, certainly in play. No Cole Irvin and probably no Baltimore for me tonight. I, I like Bailey over here a little bit. Um, Seattle and Houston, both pitchers in play. Very little offense for me outside of Houston. I think Castillo is a little bit attackable. Um, probably just going to stay off of most of Seattle here. I don't like going after Hunter Brown usually, even though there's still some variance with him. Uh, I'd probably rather play him than, than you know try and get a, a leverage piece. Uh, from Seattle here. So mostly just pitching there. Since since he in Milwaukee, a little bit of Andrew Abbott, yeah, because the Brewers are bad, but I, he's got some regression coming. I'm going to start stacking against him uh, pretty much with everybody. Corbin Burns definitely um, in this range. He's going to garner the most ownership, and I think he should. This, this makes sense to me. I want to take some shorts on some super expensive price tags for Cincinnati here. Bad, bad ball matchup too. St. Louis and the White Sox. I'm going to leave Montgomery off today. I, I've got depth and upside concerns in this particular matchup uh, for him against right-handers. Um, Dylan Cease, probably the same, to be quite honest. Uh, I think there's some other guys I'd rather play that don't have the freaking walk problem and and can get a right-hander out. It, I mean, it's just a, insane with this kid. Um, but he's in play because he's got very high strikeout stuff. Mets, San Diego, no Mets for, for me here tonight outside of uh, Pete Alonso or something like that. Maybe a Frankie Alvarez. You uh, Darvish, I think, is in play for sure. Slightly elevated price tag. Um, you know, but I, I think that's fine in tournaments at 10%. He's got plenty of upside. And San Diego here, I want to go after some Verlander. I'm, I'm going to leave him on the shelf uh, almost completely here. Pittsburgh, Arizona, very little Pittsburgh. Um, you know, late slate plays, maybe, sure, against Zach Allen. I think that's okay, but I prefer getting to Zach Allen on the late slate, on the main slate, on tomorrow's slate, you, you know, do whatever. Uh, this is fine. Going after Pittsburgh in the second time you've seen them this season. Uh, Arizona a little bit, too, uh, with some cheap pieces like Longoria, Kyle Lewis types. Uh, really good plays there against Rich Hill. Angels, Dodgers, offense only here for me. Um, I think the Angels very intriguing off the board tournament stack. Dodgers for sure. They're kind of off the board, too, even though they really shouldn't be. This is a pretty damn good spot, I think. Colorado, San Francisco, sneaky offense on the late slate here. 
uh, and sneaky Austin Gomber. Nobody's going to play him because he stinks, but uh, I think I might. Um, so, you know, you're welcome for paying the rake tonight. Uh, okay, we're done. Projections and ownership will be pushed to the site uh, very often today, um, and we'll have all of these standard deviations fleshed out as the models sort of wake up and flesh out their numbers. So that's it. Good luck to everybody here on Friday's 12-Gamer.